when I saw it, Herbert, he, he just loves playing his ukulele. And I, that's how I started. I loved the ukulele, and I saw someone doing the same thing, you know.
I had to play the accordion for a couple of years. I had to go to Bergstrom's Music Store, which was down Fort Street, carried on the bus, and it just got heavier each time I did that. You know, plus that when I went to the teacher, he'd hit me with the, hit my hands with the ruler and play the wrong note and stuff like that. And my mother, you know, had an ukulele and she played it and sang and, and so one day when I was seven years old, I asked her to teach me a song. So he, I, I learned a song called Don't Say Aloha When I Go. And then I heard Jesse Kalima record of um, Stars and Stripes, whatever. So I copied the record and uh, I played it just like the record. And I went to the amateur hour radio program at KGMB. They didn't have TV then, you know. So I went there and I passed the audition and I won first prize. Thank you. 
My first playing gig was when I was 15. I had a partner named John Lucella. He and I played the same style of uh, ukulele. This was at the Army Navy YMCA downtown. Every weekend, we played and they paid us $5. That's a lot of money in those days. I um, went to the university one year and then I decided to join the Marines. And uh, funny, I stayed in for 10 years. I was stationed. First, I went to Korea and Japan. And then I went to California, Camp Pendleton. At that time, I, I auditioned for the Ed Sullivan Show. It was in 1955, and I and, uh, auditioned for it at the Mission Ballroom in San Diego. That was the All Navy Show, and you know they dedicated um, that to the military, evidently. But then I requested to go back to Japan, you know. And they cut orders for me, and I went back to the same place in Japan.
I knew Herb Ota before he was Ota-san. I knew him from when I first came here as a student. I was a student uh, of Barbara Smith's um, at Anatomy Musicology in the 1960s. And Herb was a undergraduate student and had taken, I think, music theory from her. So a lot of times we sat around, he would be strumming on his ukulele. And he was one of the ones who, who, who turned it into a kind of a solo instrument and also brought it beyond just uh, playing music that was associated with Hawaii because a lot of Herb's um, pieces were pop tunes as well as Hawaiian music and then a lot of Japanese music as well. He also was uh, one who uh, really appreciated local culture and knew how to sort of bring it into his talking when he was talking about music. He was one of the um, instructors for the what used to be called the extension program, the, the Knight College. And so he uh, would come around and uh, teach classes uh, in the evening for uh, community people who were interested in learning ukulele. Uh, one of the uh, festivals that we, we were putting on at Orvis Auditorium, which is the music department auditorium, uh, Herb was uh, going to be part of the, uh, the program uh, doing ukulele. And so uh, I asked him, okay, what do we put on the program? Uh, a printed program to uh, uh, as the pieces you're going to play. And uh, he sort of thought about it for a while and he said, just put down her and I'll do it on my own. And I asked him why. And he said that what he likes to do is to come in and get a feel of the audience first, to see who's there, and then uh, figure out what he's going to play in relation to what he feels the audience is like. And this is kind of an interesting uh, and, and very uh, local way of, of thinking. There were other people who were doing it also, but I think Herb was one of the ones who made it uh, an international uh, tradition that, that uh, drew music from many different uh, places and cultures and also toured. So he went to Japan a lot, he played on the mainland, so people heard this kind of solo ukulele uh, probably from him as a, as a live performer. I really don't know why Herb came to see me, but um, I do know that he was interested in uh, expanding the repertoire that could be played on uh, uh, the ukulele. Herb came to play um, Debussy's Clear de Lune for me, which I had played on the piano and is really very pianistic and used a, a, a more than a five octaves of pitch range, and the ukulele's range is so much smaller. I definitely uh, admired his desire, and I had found the arrangement of uh, um, Clear de Lune to be uh, uh, very uh, artistically viable even though, of course, it was quite different from the uh, original setting in piano. Uh, and so uh, it seemed uh, very fine that he would uh, want to try to incorporate other styles. And over the years, he has uh, incorporated a huge number of styles, probably more than anyone else. It's a, a very special kind of talent, one that uh, is rare, but in his case was uh, very effective. So um, I'm really impressed.
my younger sister. She was a executive secretary for Pan American, and they wanted someone who was familiar with the Japan VIPs. And she told me, why don't I get out and work for the airline? So I got out. I got out and I, I failed the physical. I couldn't hear high frequency hearing. So the Pan Am thing fell through. So I went to go see my classmate, Galen Cam. And he was the distributor for Decca Records at that time. Um, and um, he told me, why don't you make a record, you know? I said, make a record? I said, where, where do I go make a record, you know? He said, okay, I'll introduce you to Tom McDermott, you know, and we cornered the guy. He was the president of Hula Records at that time. And Galen said, play for him. So I played him for him in the basement. He said, well, you want to record? You let me know anytime you're ready. You know, he said, OK, that was it. We made our album in one day. I don't know, the song just took off in two weeks. It was number one in Hawaii, sushi. The way I got to know Ota-san was um, I was a young man of about 20 years old and um, didn't have a job. And I heard through uh, some musician friends of mine that um, Ota-san had just returned from Japan and he, was, um, he wanted to start a group, like a quartet. And so I went and I auditioned for her and um, sang for him and I played the um, electric bass and I guess Herb liked it because um, I got into his group and you know for a number of years you know. oh it was it was exciting it was the golden age I believe of uh, Waikiki I gave Herb so much headache because um, we would have uniforms that we would have to wear, like Aloha shirts. And time and time again, I would forget what shirt we were wearing, what color shirt. So I would go, and they'd all have green, and I'd have a red shirt on. At that time, it wasn't funny. He would pull me to the side. Hey, Alvin, you like work or what? And I would hear that almost like, every so often, and I knew it would really bother him. So uh, other than that, we got along, and you know, I was able to um, just pass the time of my youth for that period of time. You know, it was just, it was just a beautiful experience for me.
importance of the ukulele to me is that it really changed my life because uh, I was already kicked out of school. Uh, I had no direction in life and I was headed down. I knew I was headed down and I thought there was nothing I could do about it. It's the, eventually I would just end up maybe serving time in prison or whatever it was destined for me. But having met Ota-san really changed my life. It, you know, I, I love the ukulele so much and I can't explain why, but I just loved it. And I would practice up to eight to 10 hours a day because I wasn't going to school. And by doing that, it kept me out of trouble. And it really turned my focus from uh, a, a youngster that had no direction in life to a purpose in life. And I wanted to beat my teacher who was Ota-san. My dream became to be better than him. The funny thing is, the more I learned about the ukulele, the more I realized how great my teacher is. <laughs> he, he's just a, an incredible musician. He was kind of a wild kid, you know. I mean, uh, he was barefooted, red hair, you know, here. He was uh, hanging around the beach, I think. I met Ota-san, uh, I believe the year was 1963 or 64. And the reason I met him is because I was trying to learn to play the ukulele, but no one could teach me. I was just totally incompetent. And there was a song that Tom Moffat played on the radio called Sushi by Ota-san. And for some reason, when I heard that song on the radio, I got fascinated with that song. It was like, wow, how could someone play like this? And every time that radio would play that song, I, whatever I was doing, I would stop and just listen. And then one day my friend tells me, hey, look, Ota-san is giving ukulele lesson. And I called Ota-san and I asked him if I could come and take lessons from him. So I went to his studio and he gave me a short interview and he said, you really want to learn? And I said, yes. And that was the start of me learning how to play the ukulele. I started teaching him and I realized he was pretty serious, you know. And everything I, that I taught him, he, he picked up and then and he was very conscientious about his lessons, you know. And um, so I taught him everything, you know, that I could think of. And then in a year and a half, I couldn't teach him anymore, you know. And um, I said, that's it, you know. I have nothing to teach him anymore, you know. I say you do whatever you want to do with 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 all the you know information that you have. I think it was about six months to a year later. He calls me on the phone and he says, "Would you like to help me teach? I am teaching an adult class on Saturday, and would you like to help?" And I says, "Of course." And all I had to do was tune the ukuleles of all his adult students. So I went there thinking that that's what I'm supposed to do. But I remember it was after one or two lessons, Ota-san told me, oh, by the way, I'm going to Japan on a two-week tour. You're going to teach. <laughs> I said, what? I've never taught before in my life. But he says, just, just do how you play the ukulele. You can teach. But I practiced so hard that week that when I went in front of them that following Saturday to teach, I, I wasn't even nervous. It just flowed out of me naturally. That was the beginning of my teaching because when Ota-san returned, he asked me, how did I like teaching? And I told him, I loved it. And then he told me, would you like to teach my students? And I said, yes. So Ota-san not only taught me how to play the ukulele, he gave me my first step in becoming an ukulele teacher. And little did I realize that that passion of teaching would last me until today, a lifetime.
I fell in love with Hawaiian music. I used to not like it. It never interested me until friends of mine uh, in high school loaned me a, a cassette of the Maka Sons of Miao. And then from then on, I just fell in love with Hawaiian music. And I used to hook up with my friends almost every night to just play music. You know, he asked me to be a part of his recording in 1989, 1990. That was like my first experience recording. From then on, it just continued. And I thought it would be cool to have him a part of my first recording. So I come home one day and I said, you know, Dad, you know, can we do a song together on my CD? He goes, okay, what song? And I said, can we do Sushi? Because it was, you know, his hit in 1964, I believe. And he goes, why do you know the, do you know how to play it? And I said, uh, no, do you have the music? And he says, do you have the tape? And I said, yeah, I have the tape. He said, go listen to the tape. So I locked myself in the room listening to his recording over and over again. After a couple hours, I got the song. So I, I was so excited. I opened my door and down, I looked down and there's a sheet music of the song. And I said, Dad, I thought you didn't have it. I said, I didn't tell you I didn't have the sheet music. I just asked you if you had the tape. <laughs> I think uh, my father and Eddie were the pioneers. Because I want people to know that, you know, it was people like them that paved the way for us. I was having lunch at the Columbia Inn. So my friend came to me and told me, Eddie, there's a boy across the street playing his ukulele. He said, come on, follow me. So I went out and I saw Herbert with his ukulele. Like, you know. So I go there, I just look. I like that. What I saw in Herbert, he, he just loves playing his ukulele. And I, that's how I started. I loved the ukulele, and I saw someone doing the same thing, you know. So can, we can just set our course. I said, do it the way you feel, what, what you want to do. I remember the most valuable thing that Eddie told me was, you have to play your music from your heart. Mm -hmm. And and at that time, I didn't know what you meant, mm -hmm. you know. But later, I found out. Yeah. <laughs> because you told me you can play a thousand songs, all difficult with all the technique in the world. But if you don't play from your heart, yeah. just one note can move a person. <laughs> and he said his cross what he wanted to do. Then I said, I always told him afterwards, I said, don't forget to pass it on to your boy, your son. So he keeps it alive.
And I said, who's under it, Bob? <laughs> he said, you come to Paris in April to record with him. I made cassette copies for all the major labels, and they all turned me down, every one of them. They say, we cannot release something like this, you know, in the rock and roll era, you know. So I released it in Hawaii only, and, you know, that thing was selling like crazy, you know. Became number one in Hawaii on uh, all the rock stations. To learn the music isn't that difficult as to live the music. You know, you have to live your life as a human being, you know, other than the music, you know. But it goes together hand in hand, you know. And um, you, you do your obligations and at the same time be human, you know. 
there's humanity involved, you know, and that's the hard part. Yeah.